Tonight we're going to look at Psalms 62, 63, and 64. Let's begin reading together here in the Psalms at Psalm 62. And uh, we'll read through the whole psalm, and we'll get into it this evening. Psalm 62, beginning at verse 1. This is a psalm of King David. Psalm 62, beginning at verse 1. And David writes, Truly my heart silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, said La. My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed in the balances, they're altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. As we look at Psalm 62, this is a psalm that that is written by David in which David expresses his confidence in the Lord. He is obviously facing opposition, and he knows that the only one that he can rely on is God. Verse 5 tells us that he knows that only God can give rest for the weary heart, so he's waiting on him. And that's what we see as we begin the psalm in verses 1 and 2. Notice how he says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He is my only rock. David once again is going through a great trial, and I'm certain those of you who have been with me on Wednesday nights going through the psalms have noticed that David writes an awful lot about enemies that oppress him, and difficult times that he goes through. And you might get the impression that David was a very melancholic, depressed man. You might think, come on, cheer up. Where's the joy in all of that? But the bottom line is, is you need to remember that David was a choice servant of the king. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a leader, and he was a man who had a tremendous relationship with God. And the closer you get to the Lord the more often the enemy attacks you. And what you have opportunity to see is really what goes on in the heart of a godly man. This isn't depression that he's experiencing. He's just simply speaking his heart out to the Lord and the things that he's going through, and he's opposed quite often, and that's what he writes about. You see, his enemies are plotting against him, and they intend to do him great, great harm. So instead of trusting in his own strength or instead of trusting in the strength of other people, He tells us that he rests his trust securely in the Lord because God is, and notice what he says, God is his salvation, God is his rock, God is his defense, which speaks of a high place or a tower, God is his glory, and God is his refuge. When he speaks concerning what God is, salvation, rock, defense, glory, and refuge, he's simply saying that my shelter is in the Lord. That's what the word refuge means. It means he's my shelter. It's normally used as a shelter that keeps the storms from pelting you with rain and all. And he's simply saying that I can trust in the Lord because this is what he is. He's my rock. He's my defense. He's my glory. He's my refuge. And all of this, God is my salvation. So what am I going to do? Well, he says, I will wait. And as he says in verse 1, I will wait silently for the Lord. I'll just wait on the Lord to come to my defense. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to wait on God to deliver me. I'm going through tremendous trials and all, and so I'll wait on Him. I'm not going to trust in the arm of flesh because man can't really help me, and I realize that, and I know that very well. Remember what he had written in Psalm 60 at verse 11 when he had said, "'Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man.'" He's simply reiterating that. He's repeating himself. He's simply saying to us something that we need to know, that God is the one who is our defense. God is the one who's going to take care of us. In Psalm 27, there's a verse there, verse 10, that really speaks to my heart. In Psalm 27, verse 10, 
He says, when, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Even the closest relationships that I have may someday let me down. Even my mom, even my dad, even my very best friends, man can't help me. If man could help me, I really don't need God. But man can't help me. And because God is the only one who can, I'm going to trust in him. That's why in Psalm 27, verse 14, the psalmist said, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so he says here in Psalm 62, 1 and 2, truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. I will not be shaken. Verse 3, how long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you. Like a leaning wall and a tottering fence, they only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. He's simply reminding himself and his reader that, that his enemies will be dealt with by the Lord. You see, his enemies see him as weak and unstable. He can't even take care of himself. And so what they're doing is they're gathering together to plot his fall. He says what they really are is they are lying hypocrites. Notice that in verse 4 when he says they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. They are lying hypocrites. They may be appearing to be his friends, but in reality what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring him down. So what do I do when I have that kind of experience? Well, verse 5, my soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and the refuge, and my refuge is in God. I want you to see that he's actually speaking to himself, if you will, here. He's, he's encouraging his own heart, and what he's saying to himself in his, what we could call today self-talk, is he's saying, you need to remain faithfully steadfast. And he's reminding himself that God is his rock, salvation, and defense, and he'll remain firm in him. There are times when the enemy has worked against me, or perhaps I'm going through some kind of situation where I actually do the same kind of thing. I strengthen myself in the Lord in that way. I remind myself of the promises of God. I encourage you to do the same. When you're going through hard times, one of the things that will lift your spirit, one of the things that will give you strength is to remind yourselves of the unfailing promises of God. And sometimes you have to speak that to yourself, if you will. You repeat those things to yourself. I've done that. I've prayed and I've said to the Lord in my prayer, I've even said to myself, not that I'm praying to myself, but thinking within, and I'll say, you know, but God's Word is true. God's Word is true. God said that I will be victorious. God's word is true, and I will strengthen myself in that. That's basically what David is doing here in verse 5 when he says, My soul waits silently for God alone. You don't have to scream. You don't have to cry. You don't have to whine. You don't have to start calling 57 prayer partners to tell them every problem you have so they can take that before the Lord. What you can do is wait silently on the Lord. You can say, Lord, you know my situation. You know the ins and the outs, the details and everything. And what I'm asking you to do is to strengthen me. What I'm asking you to do is deliver me. And, and I'm calling on you because I know that you can. I know that you're capable, and therefore I'm going to ask that you do. I believe that this, this sentiment would be the central truth of this psalm, and not only would it be the central truth of his psalm here, but this would be the central truth of David's life. The secret of David's greatness is really broken down to one thing, where he says, God is my only rock, my only help, and my only salvation. That is the strength of some of the greatest men of God and women of God that you'll ever meet. That will be their strength. It's not their eloquence. It's not their intelligence. It's not their education. It's not their connections, and it's not all the great things that have happened in their life that give them advantages. What it is is, and I'm telling you a very basic thing that every one of us should already know, but some of us fail to remember, is if you want to have, if you want to have greatness, if you want to have a central strength, it has to be resting and relying on God who is your strength. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. And sometimes we make mistakes by trusting in the arm of flesh or hoping that some human being is going to be our deliverer. The bottom line is, is as much as other people may love us and as much as they might try to help us, the bottom line is there's only one who is my salvation. There's only one who is my defense. There's only one who is my rock. There's only one who is my strength. There's only one who will defend me, really, because he knows the ins and outs of everything, and that's my God. 
And there are times that I have to just quietly, silently, just rest in the Lord and wait on Him to deliver me. And that has happened in my own Christian life, in my ministry life, many times for many years, is where you just simply just remember what your true foundation is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in the New Testament, verse 11, the Apostle Paul said this, Paul said, No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is our sure foundation, our firm strength. He's, he's the one that we've built our life on. Now, keep that in mind. If you're a Christian tonight, if you're a born-again believer, Jesus Christ is that firm foundation for your life. He is the one that you put all your attention, all your trust, all your hope, all your faith, all your expectation in. That's what it means to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart. It means to just cast everything on Him. And as you've been born again, as you've been saved, you understand that Jesus Christ is that rock in your life. You have to make a decision what you're going to trust in, and you have to build your life on something. And we believers, like David, have built our life on Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, Jesus said this, he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. The Lord is simply saying that storms come into everybody's life. I note with you that as I just read Matthew 7, 24 through 27, that the two individuals spoken of in that particular portion of Scripture both encountered the same circumstances. Yet one person's house falls and the other remains firm, and Jesus tells us why one remains firm and the other falls. It's because the one that falls is built on sand. The one that remains strong was built on the rock. Everybody goes through circumstances, trials, afflictions, and sufferings. It is not something that a single human being is exempt from. We know that. The longer you live, the more trials and the, the more afflictions you encounter. That's just the reality of life. But the longer you live in the Lord, the more you understand the necessity of building on something firm and something strong. I find it interesting to note that as I was younger, I was quite an expert on raising children. I think that I was a great expert before we had children, and it went down from there. I know that when you... I've met so many people who don't have any kids who are very good at instructing parents on how to raise their kids. And then I've, like myself, I've been a young parent who I've said, you know what, you can't lose with the technique I use, and I'm certain that I'm raising, you know, the president and you know, Secretary of State and a couple of college professors, and I ended up with four criminals. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, and you go through things through a lifetime. Now, somebody thinks I really did. No, I've only got one criminal and the rest, I don't know where they are. They <laughs> robbed a bank and they're on the lam. I don't know. Um, all I'm saying really is that that experience in time reveals what you really are built on. Every one of us goes through tough times. Every one of us goes through trials. Every one of us does. Not a single one of us is exempt from that. That's just a given. We know that. But as you grow older, you begin to see how strong your foundation is when you do endure trials and all. And you begin to see that those things that you've really firmly believed at one time, you begin to believe them even more when you see God actually acting on those things that you have most surely believed. And the one thing that I finally have been boiling down my faith to is, is the fact that God is good and that God is in control and I can trust Him because He is my strength. That is something I'm learning at my age. I'm finally realizing that, you know, that I can trust Him, and that He is strong, and, 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 and I, I don't have to fight my own battles, that, that my God fights them for me and, and my God is never lost. He, he doesn't lose fights. So I can fight my own battle and I have a good chance of losing or, or I can trust in the one who has is, is never been conquered, who, who can never lose. And see, so that's just wise. I mean, as you get older, you realize it's just, you know, just give up quicker and just trust the Lord. I have a friend of mine um, 
you know, I've known him, I, I met him actually when I was about 29, 28 or 29 years old, and, and at that time, uh, his name's Richard, and at that time, Richard was a, uh, a martial artist, you know, and so he's been practicing the martial arts for many years. He's a black belt in, in uh, Sansu Kung Fu, and, and I remember speaking to him, and as we were growing older on one occasion, I said this to him. I said, Richard, let, you, know, uh, as, uh, you know, now that you're growing older, and uh, uh, what's the difference between when you were a young black belt and now that you're an older martial arts master? What's the difference? And he said, you know the difference? He said, when I was a young man, he said, whenever I had something happen where I had to defend myself, he said, I actually liked to play with the guy before I took him out. That's an interesting way to put it, but that's, you know, I used to kind of play with the guy for a while, and then I took him out. He says, now that I'm older, he says, I won't play at all, I'll just take him out. And, and I thought that was an interesting thing. Don't get mad at me, Richard, please, ever. But I, I thought that was an interesting thing because what he was really saying is instead of relying on all my tricky moves, I just have to go to what I know best and just do it quickly and get it over with. Well, I took that into my mind because of spiritual warfare. Because sometimes I think believers want to see what they're made of in spiritual warfare, and, and maybe they want to see how close to the edge they can get without falling. For me, I just don't want to get close to the edge at all. I want to stay away from that edge as far as is possible. And when I find myself going through something tough, I want to just immediately run to the Lord and say, God, deliver me. I don't want anything to do with this. And so David is basically teaching us a very important principle that a lot of people have not learned. He's saying, you need to know what your foundation is. You need to know who your defense is. You need to know where your strength comes from. You need to know what the fortress really is. You need to know who's going to defend you. And he says, I have learned that, and that's why I can rest silently and trust in the Lord. My soul, he says in verse 5, waits silently for God alone. Notice verse 6, he only is my rock. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Why? In God is my salvation, my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Now, I notice that he has been speaking concerning what God is to him, but notice verse 8, he becomes an evangelist. He wants other people to trust in the Lord. His personal trust in God issues forth in a call for all people to trust in the Lord. And so he's calling out to people that they might do so. Why? Well, in verse 9, surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed in the balances, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Why is that? Why should my trust in God be strong, and why should people trust in the Lord? Well, he says, well, because life shows you this. The poor and the wealthy are only temporary, and in reality, they're like vapor. That means they're lightweights. Only God has substance. He goes on to say, even if you prosper financially and solve many problems, you never will be able to rely on your money. That's what he means in verse 10 when he says, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them. You can't trust in them because they're uncertain. They're uncertain. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. I was speaking to a friend of mine who had put some money into the stock market, and, and he put in, in a few thousand dollars, and, and in about a year it had grown to $87,000. And he said, man, I was, he said, man, I thought that I was a real whiz at the stock market. And then it crashed. He said, and my stocks that I bought for a few dollars each went down to like 37 cents a share. If you put your trust in, in finances, and that's the point he's making, if you put your, your trust in, in the material, he said, uh, he said that, that that will not last because materialism will never bring you to a place of, of rightness with God. It'll never give you security. In verse 11, God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, and this is what he's heard, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Power and mercy are incredible in terms of the combination. You can have power with no mercy, and you can be a tyrant. But if you have power and mercy, you're a benefactor. A person who has power without mercy can be evil. But a person who rightly uses their power is going to be merciful. And he says, this is something that you have reinforced in my life. I knew this once, and I've heard this twice. In other words, you have reinforced this in me, that you have power. But not only do you have power, God, 
God, you also have mercy. You have love towards me. And not only that, in verse 12, when he said, uh, to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, you render to each one according to his work. God, you have the ability to save, and you love us enough to do so. And as we trust in you, you will save us. But if I don't trust in you, and I trust in myself or weak human beings, then ultimately when I stand before you, I'll be judged as one who has rejected you. And God is going to bring everything into judgment. In Jeremiah 17, verse 10, God said, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Ultimately, God is a righteous judge. He intends for us to go to heaven, so he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. But if we reject him, then we ultimately end up going to the place that we have chosen for ourselves. We were looking at this just this last Sunday in relation to eternal punishment and all, and I pointed out something very simple, a very basic thing. God has done everything he can to rescue me from hell, but if I reject his attempts, I ultimately have made the choice. Therefore, he doesn't send me to hell. He gives me permission to follow my will. And my will is to reject him. Ultimately, we have opportunities and choices that we make. God says, I love you. I've demonstrated my love for you. I've shown you my power, and I've shown you my mercy. In my son, Jesus Christ, he demonstrated my power in the variety of the things that he did, including the miracles that he performed, which demonstrated to you that I'm a God of mercy because in Jesus, we remember that Jesus raises the dead, Jesus heals the sick, Jesus ministers to the, the hungry. I showed you my mercy. I showed you my mercy for three and a half years as Jesus walked and did all of these works and called people. I showed you my mercy in that, and I've shown you my power. But if you reject that, then you're going to be left to my judgment. And if you want to stand before God in your own righteousness, then you're doomed, you're lost. Because in order for me to enter into heaven, my righteousness is not sufficient. The Bible says it's like filthy rags. What I need is I need a new suit of clothes, and that comes through Jesus Christ. When he washes me with his blood, he takes my sin from me, and I can stand before God in the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And in that way, I enter into the kingdom of God by faith in him. So he demonstrated his power, and he demonstrated his mercy to me. Now, moving on into Psalm 63, this is another Psalm of David, beginning at verse 1. David says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I, I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Now, I want you to see this. This spoke to my heart as I was preparing this Bible study. I want you to see this when he says in verse 1, O, o God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. This is something that only a genuinely saved person can say to God when he says, you know what, Lord, I am thirsty for you. This is something only a genuinely saved person would ever say. Listen, there are people who, um, who say, well, yeah, I'm a believer, but they don't have a thirst for the Lord. They don't have a hunger for him. They don't have this, this, this desire in their heart to know him and, and to worship him and to love him. Uh, they've taken the Lord and they've basically made him one of the various things that entertain their life. But 
He's not the center of their life. He's not the core of their life. He's not the, the, the passion of their life. You know, they have various things on the throne of their, of their heart. Various things take their turn in ruling their passions. And, and, and God isn't the center of everything. He isn't, the, he isn't that focal point of, of all things in their life. But, but for David, David could, could say very honestly, uh, I, I seek you. You are my God. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. I'm in a very dry and thirsty land where there's no water. And, and so what I've done is I've, I've taken joy in going to your sanctuary just to spend time with you that I might be able to just enjoy and love you and fellowship with you. The world is like a spiritual humidifier, if you will. It's dry, it dries you out. And so what I have is a thirst, and I have a thirst for you. This reminds me of what uh, took place in the Gospel of John in chapter 4. You remember the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria? You remember how she came to that well? Jesus was there at noon, and, and his boys went off to go get something to eat, and while well, Jesus was there, you remember how this woman came with her water pot, and she came there to draw some water? And I've shared this so many times with you. All of you remember this, I'm sure, how, how that in, in that society, women would draw the water, and that's, that's part of the tasks of, of their household duties and all. And so they would come, but they normally came in either one of two different times during that day. Either they would come early in the morning or they would come late at night to draw the water. Now, the well that they would come to in this particular well is the well of Sychar there in, in Samaria. Uh, the well that they would come to was a central meeting place. And so, when the women would come in the morning or in the evening, they would come at that place not simply to draw the water, but they would sit down and they would visit and they would share. And that was really a place of social activity. This woman, though, we have uh, in, in, uh, in John chapter 4, this woman at the well, this woman of Samaria comes at noon. And for anybody who's aware of, of the Jewish customs or the customs of that land during that time, uh, immediately when John tells us it was noon and Jesus was by the well, immediately they know something is up because a woman doesn't come at noon. So it tells us something about the woman immediately just by the time. And as Jesus is sitting there, it's noon, and she comes with her water pot to draw water. They're telling us that this is a woman who has no social contact. He's telling us that this is an outcast in, in Samaria, in that village. This is a woman who has no friends. That's immediately what you're hearing. And when Jesus is there at the well and he speaks to her, you also see something taking place that was unheard of, and it's, it's this. You see a man addressing a woman that did not take place unless there were others around. But Jesus is there by himself, and he's breaking a social taboo, and he's speaking to a woman who's ostracized. And what you're watching is God reaching down into the life of an individual who is totally lost and abandoned, and God is breaking taboos to reach this person. And when Jesus speaks, he says, give me something to drink. He's actually giving her an invitation to serve him because in giving him water, she's serving him, and he's actually laying down a foundation for her so he can give her an invitation. And it began with, you need to serve me. Give me something to drink. She begins to look, and she says, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. You know, what are you gonna get? where are you, you going to get water from? And, and how is it that you, being a Jew, speak to me, a woman of Samaria, and then John says, uh, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. He was also breaking an ethnic taboo. Jesus was breaking several, several things in this one conversation. And as he begins to talk to this woman and share with her, he speaks to her concerning water that he has to offer people. In John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You want to have natural water, you'll get thirsty again. But I have something to offer you that is better than natural water. That's what he's speaking about. I have something that will quench your spiritual thirst. Well, she looks at him. You know, in part of the conversation, she ultimately says to him, oh, give me this water. I'd love to drink it. So I don't have to come and draw water again. Well, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. And this you have rightly said, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Now, what is that all about? Just, let's do this for just a moment. You've had five men that you called husband. You're living with a guy. He's not your husband. Living with a guy doesn't make him your husband. So you've had six men in your life. You're thirsty. In the scriptures, number seven is the number of perfection, and that represents God. And Jesus is simply saying this, you've gone through every man, 
Six is the number of man. You have gone through all men, but now you've come to perfection. You've tried human relationships, but I have a spiritual one to offer you. The water that you've been drinking, the relationships you've had, the life that you've been living has left you dry. But I can give you water that will quench your thirst to such a degree that you will never thirst again. And the water that I give to you will spring up in everlasting or eternal life in you. You see, now David is speaking about that kind of subject here when he says, my soul thirsts for you in a dry and thirsty land. See, only a person who knows the Lord can even say, Lord, I know you can quench this thirst in me. And that's a hunger for fellowship with God. And this is what we're seeing in this psalm here. I've looked for you, he says in verse 2. I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. I, I, I long to have fellowship with you because, in verse 3, your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. In other words, I am totally satisfied with your love, and it causes me to worship you, and it causes me to praise you. Your loving kindness is better than life. That's what he's saying. My lips shall praise you. He says, I lift up my hands in your name. I'm worshiping and I'm praising you. I am satisfied with your love and I desire nothing else. Because fellowshipping with you satisfies me more than a gourmet banquet would satisfy my flesh. In John 6, 35, Jesus said this. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He, comes, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. That's why when you got saved, that's why when I got saved, I didn't say, all right, I got Jesus, now let's try Buddha. You know, all right, I got Jesus, let's see what Muhammad has to say. No, when I came to Jesus Christ, I said, I don't need anything else. I don't need anyone else. I've got all that I need in him. He's the bread of life. He's the one who produces in me that, 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 that quenched thirst. I mean, it's his spirit that enters into my life, and, and, and the fellowship with him is everything. And, and because that is true, you know, I can worship the Lord, and I can praise the Lord, and I, and, and, and I want you to notice this. He says, I will lift up my hands in your name. That's a, that's a, a, a pose of worship. I, sometimes in our fellowship, you know, we may encourage you. Our worship leaders might say, let's raise our hands to the Lord. And every once in a while, I've heard them say that they're just encouraging you to do what is biblical. That's all it is. It's making an offering to the Lord of yourself. Let's worship the Lord. Let's raise up our hands. And then every once in a while, I've had people say, oh, I'm not going to be having people tell me to worship the Lord and raise my hand. If I don't want to raise my hands, I'm going to, you know what? Keep them in your pocket, sourpuss. But if you want to worship the Lord, raise your hands to the Lord. David said, I love you. Because of your loving kindness, I raise my hands to the Lord. It's an act of service, worship, and surrender to God. It's an offering to Him, and it's very biblical. It's very biblical. And he's saying, because I love you, this is why I do that. And I'm, I'm satisfied with you. In verse 6, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I'll rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. When I can't sleep at night and I'm laying there tossing and turning and I've got things on my mind, oh, I remember you. And as I remember you, I begin to focus on one thing about you. I think about how much you love me. You have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your, your right hand upholds me when I'm there at night tossing and turning. The thing that gives me the ability to sleep in peace is when I put my mind back on you where it belongs, when I meditate on you and I think about you at night. And I guess everyone here who's, who's been alive for a while has had sleepless nights. Every one of us, I, I'm sure I'm speaking to some, I know that there are people out here who know exactly what he's talking about. When you're laying there in bed and you've got so many things on your mind, you just, you can't even sleep. Now, how do you get to sleep? He says, when my heart is stirred and I just begin to think of how much you love me. And I realize that the problems I have are inconsequential to you. I realize that there's not a single thing impossible for you. I realize that you love me, and, and, and seeing that you do love me, 
this is going to work out for good in my life. Even though I might not be able to see exactly how that will be right now, I know that one day I'll turn around and I'll look back at this and I'll see how you orchestrated so many different things to coincide at the right moment to deliver me and to produce in me a heart of thankfulness. And therefore, I can sleep at night because you're in control. I can sleep at night because you love me and I trust you and you're protecting me. And you know what? There have been many times in my life that I have, as a Christian, I've gone to bed with my mind racing about so many things, so many needs and so many concerns. And, and you know what puts me to sleep, you know? I listen to Rawl on the radio. That always puts me to sleep. No, um... <laughs> can I hear an amen? No, um... No, what puts me to sleep is when I begin to just pray. I just pray. And I say, Lord, this is my situation, and I know you can deliver me. I trust you, and I can go to sleep. And that's what David's talking about right here. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Verse 9, but those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. God, you protect me, and you defend me from those who seek my life, and I know that your justice will ultimately prevail, and therefore I trust you in everything. In verse 11, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Ultimately, those who lie about us will be dealt with because truth always wins in the end. I underlined this particular scripture and even put a place where God spoke to me. It was in Jerusalem on February 25th, 1995, at the Holiday Inn, where it says, the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. You want to know something funny? I don't remember the exact details about that, but I do remember but as, of, as I was reading this today, I do remember taking time to write that because there had been some things that were being said. I do remember that. And thank God I don't remember the details anymore about what was being said. But there were lies, and I remember that. And I was thinking that I had to do something about that, and the Lord gave me this scripture right here when it says, the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. He'll close those mouths, and so just trust in me. Again, I've shared this with you before. I'll close with this thought and then move to the next psalm. Either you defend yourself or you trust the Lord to defend you. I want to trust the Lord to defend me. And then finally in Psalm 64, Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity who sharpen their tongue like a sword, who bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So he will make them stumble over their own tongue. All who see them shall flee away. All men shall fear and shall declare the work of God for they shall wisely consider his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. Psalm 64, once again, it's a psalm of David, and David is crying out to the Lord that God will preserve him from the threats of his enemies. Now, as you look at this, remember with me that David can be an example for all believers because he shows us what we need to do when we encounter hard times. David would come to the Lord with heartfelt prayer, and he would cry out to God for deliverance. And that's what he's doing here in verse 1 when he says, Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Then he says, Preserve my life from, uh, from fear of the enemy. So he's basically simply saying, God, I know that you will deliver me from that one who is trying to harm me. Verse 2, Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. Now look at verse 3, who sharpen their tongue like a sword, bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. Now David's enemies 
are, are trying to destroy him by plotting against him. Notice he says they're using their words against him as a weapon, and they're hitting him uh, without warning and really without provocation. There's no reason for them to do this. But as I was looking at this verse, I, I heard something today. I'm going to read to you a quote, but I want to make it a, a applicational for us here in the 20, uh, 21st century when he says, uh, concerning these who are workers of iniquity, uh, evil workers, notice again, he says, they sharpen their tongue like a sword, bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words. Bitter words. Um, I guess all of us watch the news. I'm assuming we do. I do. I don't know why, but I do. I watch the news. And as I watch the news, I, I, I was watching it tonight and, uh, and also was watching it yesterday. And, and um, so perhaps some of you heard about this. I'm sure all of us did in this room. Um, Linda Ronstadt was at the Aladdin Hotel, and she was doing her musical set. And in her conclusion, she basically wanted to dedicate her final song, Desperado, to her, her hero, uh, Michael Moore. And, um, and apparently, some of the patrons who had come just to hear a concert got upset and stormed out. Some of them were very angry, apparently, and they did some damage to some pictures, I guess. And, you know, they made it very clear that they were not happy at her um, injecting something into a concert they didn't pay to hear her political opinions. And so these are people, I want you to get the scene for a minute. I was talking to Marie about this tonight, and I hope this makes sense to you. If it doesn't, well, we'll edit it from the tape and, and such is life. But it, it made sense to me as I was talking to my wife tonight. I said, it's interesting that Linda Ronstadt got so, so upset over what took place and, and said this. This is a quote. This is what she said. At least this is what I understand to be a quote. It was, it was placed in uh, this news source as a quote. And this is Linda Ronstadt and her response to what took place. Perhaps you've heard this already. Linda Ronstadt said, It's a real conflict for me when I go to a concert and find out somebody in the audience is a Republican or fundamental Christian. It can cloud my enjoyment. I'd rather not know. And I thought, Let's see, and I, I, tell me if this makes sense to you. I was talking to Marie, and I said, no, wait a minute, let's see. People were in Las Vegas, and they're at a Linda Ronstadt concert, and she says something that upsets them. So they go out and they throw their mixed drinks on her picture, and she's thinking those are fundamental Christians. <laughs> I said... Something doesn't connect here. You know, she should continue singing, but please don't speak in public. You're embarrassing. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. But what I really found was, you know, I, I don't know if the word offensive is right, but what I found interesting at least is how she lumps together, you know, whom she per perceives as her enemies in, in two classifications. And, and, you know, the Republican thing, I found that's interesting, but the fundamental Christian, you know, she ha don't tell me there's a fundamental Christian in a concert because it upsets me and I won't enjoy myself singing. What's that all about? But here's something else for you. I don't think any Democrat would appreciate this. She's saying, I'd rather talk to pagan Democrats than born-again Republicans. <laughs> Boy, that's a pretty bright thing to say. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense, you know. And, and as I was thinking about that, I thought, verse 3, who sharpen their tongue like a sword, bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words. This is what you hear constantly. These are things that are said about believers all the time, that you're, you're a backward, backward uh, imbecile, you're an intellectual hillbilly. You know, I, I have heard so many things that, uh, about Christians over the years. And I turned to Maria and I said, you know, it was just a little over 30 years ago, um, about 34 years ago, that Time magazine was uh, putting in its front page that, that, that God is, al uh, is alive, that the Jesus movement and the revolution, what happened in 30 years? What happened? Where the believer at one time was actually there. I mean, I can remember seeing, some of you maybe are old enough to remember seeing this. If not, let me tell you, it was in one of the mags that was either uh, Time or, or Newsweek. I can't remember which one, but Pastor Chuck was there at, and he was doing a, a beach baptism. 
And it was in, in, a, in a, a magazine that is nationally syndicated, and they're saying the Jesus movement has hit California, spreading throughout the nation. And now, 30 years later, Linda Ronstadt doesn't want to know if you're in the audience because you're going to ruin her gig. It, it amazes me. And it's bitter words. They're bitter words. I, 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 I assure you that Linda has never met a genuine, I would assume at least, never met a genuine believer who will love her and care for her and pray for her and be there for her because that's what believers are. That's what we do. But apparently she doesn't see that. And you want to know something? We see that today, bitter words that are spewed out and they hit you without you even realizing it. They hit you from nowhere. That's what David's talking about. These are people who are plotting his demise. They want to harm him. And that's what he's speaking about. Verse 4, it says that, that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. It comes out of nowhere for no reason. They're using their words as weapons, and they're hitting me without any warning. That's the point he's making. Verse 5, he says, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who'll see them? They devise iniquities. We've perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of men are deep. And they think they're going to get away with this because they're doing it secretly. They're saying, well, who sees us? But they forget that God sees everything. The Bible tells us in Psalm 121, verses 1 through 4, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. My help comes from God. They think they're going to get away with this, but they will not. God is watching very closely. Verse 7, God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded, so we will make them stumble over their own tongue. All who see them shall flee away. All men shall fear, shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. Even as the wicked suddenly ambush the godly, God will suddenly overtake them. The evil they spoke about will ultimately come upon themselves. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 12, 13, the wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips. The righteous will come through trouble. So the things that they're plotting against us are going to come back on them. Verse 10, the righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. So what do we do? Well, we, we hope in the Lord during our hard times. Why? Because God will vindicate his servants, and he's simply telling us your cries that you cried will be turned to rejoicing. The tears that you cry sometimes because of how people have treated you, the things that they've said about you, the times that you have felt, I have to stand up and defend myself. I don't think that anybody will. And the Lord has said, you just hold your peace and I'll take care of this. But Lord, you see that th these are blows coming out of nowhere. I didn't do anything to, do, to, 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 you know, deserve this. Why is this happening to me? What did I do? And the Lord will say, you know what? I'm refining you right now. I'm refining you. I'm going to give you something you've been asking for. Didn't you ask me to give you character? Well, yes, Lord, I, I, I did. Well, how do you think character is formed? Well, I thought that you would just kind of, kind of unscrew the top of my head and drop character in. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. It's kind of like my son David. I've told you this before. When David was in high school and he approached me, and, and uh, he was about 15 or 16 at the time, and he said, Dad, I've been praying that God will give me the gift of tongues. And I looked at my son, and I thought, this is unusual. I haven't heard him ever say anything like that before. Boy, this blesses me. I said, really? He said, yes, I want God to give me the gift of tongues, Dad. And I said, wonderful. He said, I want him to, to give me Spanish. <laughs> I said, oh, really? <laughs> well, see, he was going to school taking Spanish classes, and he wasn't doing too well. So he had been praying that God would somehow give him Spanish. And I said, you know what? That's a prayer that God will answer, son. You will speak Spanish. He said, really, Dad? Can you guarantee that? I said, yeah, if you study <laughs> and you work hard. I said, what do you think? God's going to unscrew the top of your head, and tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and say, bueno, yes, I don't think so. It doesn't work that way, you know. <laughs> you got to work at it. You know, the Lord does bring things into our life, that's for sure, but ultimately what he does is he trains us that we can wait on the Lord because God's timing is perfect. And so instead of me trying to take care of my own business, I just take care of my character. If I take care of my character, the rest is going to be taken care of by the Lord. Keep that in mind, guys. Don't try and defend yourself. Just trust in the Lord. Just meditate on him, love him, and realize God is with you no matter what. God will take care of you.
May we learn to trust in him.